Good evening and welcome to Ryder Greg on Twitch.tv. I'm glad everyone who is able to make it tonight and all of those who will be watching on demand either on Twitch.tv or YouTube.com. Glad that everyone could make it tonight and looking forward to another night of working on the World Anvil Summer Camp 2020 Challenge where we will be working on two more prompts. Uh, let's see if I remember, 26 and prompt 27. And interspersed between those, we will be doing critiques and showcases of other members of the World Anvil community who ha are competing in the same challenge. And Galadan, welcome. Glad to see that you made it. Thank you so much. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, before we start tonight, I kind of wanted to show a little something that I've been working on, and this is um, this is a emote that I have been working on for those who are subscribers to the Twitch.tv channel. I've been working on this in Inkscape, and Inkscape is a uh, drawing application that's vector based. It's open source, similar to Adobe Illustrator. And this is what I've been working on so far. And it's been a lot of fun. It may not look like a lot, but some thought did go into it. And so this is definitely not done, but it is. And also it's going to look more like you know, something like that when it's actually going to be used on the raid icons. So it may look uh, rather plain up upside when you look at it, but when you get down to uh, a 1% viewing size, it's going to be rather small. So that's just some of the things that I've been working on off the off of the stream so that I can keep focused on the stream on the writing. So with that, we'll just go ahead and jump on in and make sure that this is something I definitely want to save, but I have been thoroughly enjoying uh, working on and drawing and trying to make things look fun. And it will be, it will definitely be uh, fun when it's done. Aaron, welcome, glad to have you here. Just uh, going over an emote in progress. Wanted to give that share. All right, uh, with that, we're, we'll just go ahead and jump right in to World Anvil. First of all, a big shout out to the Anvilite Streamer Corps. We are members of the World Anvil community who stream live on Twitch or other platforms and share world building and building community and helping everybody become better world builders or better writers. I do come from the writing world and so that's what I've been focusing on and glad that everyone could come. If this is your first time to this, this stream, I sure would appreciate a follow. And if you want to see more of these, you can visit my VOD down below or visit me at youtube.com. And there are many individuals all across the time zones who are able to uh, stream and share their thoughts. And literally, I think we are covered 20, uh, 24-7. There is not a moment of time when someone is not streaming for at least the next 24 hours and I think that is 24 maybe even 36 hours that is crazy so if you have any questions on what is out there just feel free to let me just copy that and throw that into that is not wanting to paste okay maybe I didn't copy control a c and there we go. So if you if you are interested in any of the other members of the Envelite Streamer Corps, feel free to uh, click that link, bookmark it, and join us in your respective time zones for streaming, world building, and a lot of fun. All right, with that, we will go ahead 
and start thinking about, uh, wrong mouse. I will start working here on the uh, next prompt for the day. And that prompt is write about a technology from the history of your world. Is it lost to the ages or did it shape the world today? Now, I'm, I have two ideas for this prompt and not sure which way I'm going to be taking it because I could do one of two things. There is a technology that is lost to my world and that is magic. During the Great Decimation of 1123 CE, all of the people who uh, do that will... Uh, will lose their magic. Aaron, you have a live fiction critique, but my story is uh, 2,400 words. Is it a World Anvil article or is it uh, generic fiction? And also, uh, is it family friendly? Because 2,400 words isn't that long. I, I, I probably wouldn't be able to get uh, do a line by line, but your call. If you have the lemon points for it, that'd be awesome. Yes, World Anvil article, but not for summer camp. And yes, some mild language, but nothing serious. Okay. If let's do a let's do a writing sprint, and you can cue that up, and we could then do that after the first writing sprint, and then we would be able to, and we'll just just go through it. So that works out well. And Zog Mad Dog is raiding. Welcome everyone who is joining us from Mad Dog's channel. Glad that you could all be here, and just in time. We are about to start a writing sprint, and after which we will be doing a critique of Aaron's uh, art, an article. So those of you who are ready to go, we will start up the chronology. Oh, well, before we do that, um, welcome everybody, glad that you could be here. And we're gonna be writing about a technology in the world. And the technology, I have, I'm of, I'm of two minds here. Maybe you could help me out. In, in a previous article, I talked about my, my core animal cores uh, that are these magical batteries that power magic, but also someone invented it to be able to power automatons. Now, this is a way to be able to insert steampunk or steampunk-esque stories into a later era of my world's development. So I could talk more about that, but it'll be a lot of repeats from a previous article, or I could go into talking about the magic system that I have set up for Saga Dorm and Talk, because it is something that is lost during the Great Decimation. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Does anyone, you know, have any ideas or preferences on which one that I use tonight? I could really go either way. Okay, we got... All right, we have Aaron's article that we will get to after the writing, uh, writing sprint. Got to run for about four, run off for about 45 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, then uh, I'll try to aim to do that article at the top of the hour in about 50 minutes. So we'll let you know when we get back. Yeah, that works. Just uh, let me know. I'll hold that in reserve and we'll, I'll uh, try to strive about the top of the hour. 
Yes, thank you for letting me know when you'll be back. Okay. I don't know how to do a poll in here in <laughs> uh, World Anvil, but if there's uh, no objections, I think I'm going to talk about the magic because the magic system that I have has not really, I haven't really delved into it that much. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and work on that for this prompt because it is sort of a technology. It is a means of doing something that was lost. Okay, so I'm gonna call this the, oh, gotta turn off that caps lock. The lost magic of, of the, the fairies. Okay, take off the draft, go to navigation. And it's really, um, last night, as far as technology goes, I think my new, how I have my monitors configured has been a big success. Even though I have a monitor down here that I'm looking at when I'm reading, it doesn't look like it, you're not getting the full, you know, full bald spot experience when I'm reading off of this monitor down here. So I, I have enjoyed that aspect of uh, this. Uh, this new setup. All right, so we are, whoa, come on. Summer camp, the lost magics of the fairy, and we are gonna save those changes. Okay, so let's take a look at this article template and see what kind of things that we may be able to th throw in here. Let's see, we have our vignette, we have discovery, access availability, complexity, utility, manufacturing, inventor, parent technologies. I, I now this is it. Let me take a look at this. Um, the, I'm, I'm taking a look at the quick articles here because is there an actual, there's a spell, but there isn't so much of a magic category. So I think I'm okay uh, going with that. So we'll just hide that quick action. So everyone who is working on a prompt, uh, take note of what your word count is at this time. And then in 15 minutes, we will uh, go forward and count up those words. And hopefully you'll be able to get a hundred, two, or even 300 words in the next 15 minutes. And don't worry about how many words you do or do not have. You will have more words at the end of the sprint than what you started with. So let's go for it. Let's. All right, there we go. The countdown is going. The magic of the fairies of Saga Dorm Magical Era uh, Train a word. I gotta train this word. I mean it's embarrassing how many times I see that and it just wants to do that double thing. So vac vocabulary, add a new word or phrase, call it saga dorm. Okay, it's one word. Saga dorm. All right, let's see how well that worked. Saga dorm. Saga dorm. Forget it. Period. Welcome, Dazzlecat. 
you're on a D&D session supper break. Oh, we're on a writing sprint. So uh, enjoy listening to me talking about magic and hope that you have fun during your uh, D&D session. Lasted between the years 623 BCE and 11... 23 CE period during these hundreds of years comma fairies were able to perform the magics once reserved for the dragons period The magics ended during the Great Decimation of 1123 CE, period. The first practitioner of magic was Vola Rathana, period. She was a slave to the last dragon of Saga Dorm, comma, named Suviklarg. Period. During an altercation in which Suviklarg died, comma, all of his powers and knowledge were transferred to Vola. Period. Please see the manuscript, comma, The Fairy's Hope, The Runaway's Hope, comma, for details, period. As magic was The ability to perform magic was based on being a descendant of a fairy, comma, very few practitioners were available for many decades, period. After centuries, however, the fairies sp had spread throughout the world, period. Eventually, they formed a fairy council to help establish peace amongst the different countries of Saga Dorm. Period. Due to rising tension between countries and anti fairy sentiments, comma, it was decided that all magics would be, open quote, destroyed, period, close quote. All 16 variants of magic were placed within the 16 totems of Trilinius, period. Magic The magic of the dragons and fairies followed very specific rules for them to be performed. Period. Foundational to all magic are the cores of the blessed animals. Period. These petrified crystals consolidated the magical energies of the blessed animals and powered the 
spells that were used by the fairies, period. Depending on the level and complexity of the magic being formed, performed, comma, one or more crystals would be required, period. Please see cores for more details, period. The magical spells performed by the fairies came in multiple forms. period. The lowest level of magic that was performed required a sign language to be cast. Hey, Dinosaur Bob, welcome. Period. The dragons when they performed their magic, comma, would wave their claws through the air and trace glyphs to invoke the magics, period. The more dexterous or flexible the dragon's appendages, comma, the more complicated the magic could being performed could be, period. The dragons, comma, never went beyond the crude sign language to perform their magics because they were not able to verbalize and they spoke and communicated telepathically, period. It wasn't until the fairies that spoken incantations for spells were discovered, period. The next tier of magic are those that require spoken incantations, period. Magic that is able to be performed by a fairy who has the ability to speak, comma, unlike the dragons, comma, opened up huge possibilities for new magics to be discovered, period. These spoken incantations were more powerful when paired with the fine sign language skills developed by the fairies, period. Fairies being able to make intricate traces and hand gestures were able to refine the crude nature of the magic previously performed by the dragons, period.
the final tier of magic are those that require components to be added to the spells incantation and sign language to be performed period these magics revolve primarily around the reconstituting of petrified blessed animal body parts and imbuing magic within them that could then be released at a later time when consumed by the fairy, period. This was the last classification of magic that was discovered prior to the Great Decimation, period. There were many experiments performed to see if non-magical humans would be able to consume the potions that were crafted by the fairies, period. The earliest assumptions were that you had to be magical to be able to consume magic, period. However, through illicit means and unauthorized experimentation on human subjects, comma, the Fae were able to discover methods to change the magics magical potions to be able to work on humans, period. Though the means of this discovery was illicit, comma, once proven by the fairy council to be safe, these practices and constructions were readily and frequently practice, period. This allowed in some small measure to allow magics to be given to everyone, period. This was especially helpful in the role of medicine and healings. Period. All right, four, three, two, one, and the sprint is over. All right, count up your words and let's see how we did. I'm going to copy that. I'm just going to dump this all into my vignette save those changes and everyone save your changes right now save them you don't want to lose any words tonight all right let's see how we did here on my metadata 629 words all right we will go to NaNoWriMo And Roll Society, welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for the host. We just finished up a word sprint, and we're so glad that you could make it tonight. All right. So we just finished up the prompt on a lost technology, and uh, I kind of stretched it a little bit, calling magic a technology because I actually lose magic in my world. And that allows me to have a 
a steampunk world and a, an urban fantasy in the centuries that follow, centuries and millennia that follow this current time frame. All right, so with that, if um, we're, a, we're, of course, that was only a 15 minute sprint. So if there is anyone out there who has a article that they would like to have showcased, if you could redeem your lemon points in the chat and send me the link, we can we can read those over at this time. And if not, uh, we could jump into another sprint. And we are saving errands for the top of the hour or whenever they notify me of, of their return. And for those uh, new viewers, I will share with you a little preview. This is the beginnings of my Lemon Raid emote that I'm in the process of creating. And this is uh, used in Inkscape. This is an open source alternative to Adobe Illustrator and it's vector base. And so uh, it looks really big right now, but when you go to, you make it super small. Let's see if I can, yeah, when you make it super small, it doesn't look too bad. All right, Dinosaur Bob, all right, you have redeemed an, an article here. Let's jump to it. Okay, I am going to turn off the music while we do that. Let's zoom in a little bit. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, because, yeah, that works well. I like, I like big fonts and I cannot lie. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. All right. A merchant minder captain greeting another upon her return from a mission. The merchant minder's hall. All right. Ah, Carlina, welcome back. I trust your journey was uneventful. It was excellent. Yes, it's always good to know when the bandits are hiding before you even strike out on the road. Surprised him? Good. I'll warrant. Well, sit down, relax. Ye earned a relax and rest, and ye better enjoy it before they send you out again. The Cafe ships are due any day. We'll be busy once they dock. All right. Uh, this is a boring one. Ah, uh, there's nothing boring in world building. Come on. Uh, which prompt is this, Bob? Is this... Uh, a rebuilt place or all right an unassuming building amid several larger more opulent structures the merchant minders hall is easy to spot it's not run down or an eyesore by any stretch of the imagination. It's just not as gaudy or grandiose as many of the other buildings. Headquarters. Ah, any of the other buildings in its vicinity. This reflects the attitudes of the building's owners relative to those of their neighbors. The architecture of the K Cafe Exchange Hall on its left exudes its the wealth that changes hands daily within its walls. The opulence and rare materials of the merchant's grand bazaar on its right do likewise. The merchant minder's hall speaks of practicality and purpose. This is exactly the message its occupants wish to extend. Purpose and function. The building houses, the building houses three main types of facilities offices for the senior members of the merchant minders, as well as their administrative clerks occupy the main central portion of the structure when one enters the building. Two major functions occur in these offices. New jobs are contracted and paid for with the merchants of the city and trip 
reports provided by minor, minder captains upon return from an assignment are analyzed and acted upon as needed. Okay, a uh, very long sentence. And, you know, when I was doing my dictation for the last spr uh, sprint, I remembered a lot of my advice that I gave Gift of Gabby last night about the two, the two breath rule, the, you know, keeping the sentences short. And I realized that I was breaking my own rule in that first draft there. And that's something I will definitely need to polish up upon as I revisit these articles. Now, I would say an exception to that rule would be when you have a clause like this that precedes the colon, and then when, if you have long lists here. Now, this is a, this is still a pretty long um, thing, and I believe if this phrase here is a complete sentence, meaning subject, uh, predicate, uh, verb, I believe that you would use a semicolon to separate the portions of the list as opposed to a comma when they're independent clauses. I think. I'm pretty sure about that, uh, but I'm pretty, I, I'm, I'm sure on that, pretty, I'm pretty sure on that. Okay, but no one's perfect. All right, an example of this would be updating of current hazard records if a record indicated the need to add, remove, or modify any trail cairns. I do like those trail cairns. In the wing of the to the left, as, soon as seen when viewing the building from outside, an extensive archive preserves the records of every mission that the merchant minders have undertaken. These records consist of the detailed trip reports that each team captain is required to file when returning home. Special records provide easy access to a captain about to set out to obtain a relatively up-to-date assessment of best and worst stopover points, anticipated costs, costs of resupplying along the route, and, most importantly, Anticipated trouble spots where threats to the caravan may be encountered. The wing to the right is divided into a few meeting rooms and a large club room. This room, open only to captains of the minders or their superiors, is a place for captains waiting for their next assignment to mingle and share information. It is the information gathered here, along with the records in the archives, that have helped hone the reputation of the merchant minder captain as being one who can unerringly see trouble before it manifests. There is a large enclosed courtyard behind the main structure. The building elements forming the side and back walls of this courtyard are a combination of storage and utility spaces, such as kitchens. The courtyard is constantly use, in use for advanced swordplay practice for captains. The merchant minders own other facilities in the city where lower-ranking members and new recruits are trained and housed. These other facilities do not come with the amenities of the captain's club offered in the hall. Architecture Oh, that's pretty. The building was constructed in the present form, question mark, occupying what was then an empty space between Cafe Exchange and Grand Bazaar. The form of the building is not strange to Edmure, but it, oh, sorry. But it does seem out of place for the particular district within Edmure where it stands. This was intentional. The merchant minders intend to portray an image of practicality, frugality, and effectiveness, and the site choice for the building was intended to ensure that even the most wealthy and powerful of the merchants of Endmere, even the members of the Four family, were constantly reminded of the importance that the merchant minders play in their success. 
150 years, Great Hall, Free City of Endemere, Merchant Minders. Okay, closing quote. You see that simple building at the end of the street there? The one that's not made of marble and stone like the fancy ones around it? That there's the most important building in all of the city. It's not for the folks in that building, and my Endemere traders be a f easy pickings for all the highwaymen twixt here and the kingdom. And for those things worse than highwaymen twixt here and the Feywood, that there be the Merchant Minder Hall, finest, most reliable caravan guards this side of the kingdom. Appreciative merchant pointing out the reason for his success. Forgot to link the four families. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not... Um, I don't really have anything much to say. It, while, yeah, you could say this was a boring article. Ten points to anyone who recognized the building picture. Well, oh, just building image, click your free vector images from Pixel Bay. Uh, it, look, it looks English or colonial. Um, the people that are dressed here, I mean, their dresses... Larger skirts. We have these things. Those those look definitely uh, industrial British or. And that's just a weather vane. That's not a cross. How am I doing so far? <laughs> um. Yes. <laughs> um, I would, I would also, Mer I would also guess that this is not it European. Only because it's not jammed up close to other similar buildings, and you have these things going across here. So I would have, if okay, wild guess, getting warm, okay. Um, I would guess that this is a colonial state house or because you have that tower there. That would be a place for bells. And I would believe that this was a governmental building of some kind in colonial America, probably in the southern states, because you have these large windows here that are opened. And if it was in the northern colonies, they wouldn't have those because... Oh, Independence Hall... In Philadelphia. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I've actually been there. Uh, it was... <laughs> let's not say how many decades ago it was. My parents and I took a trip there. And siblings. Independence Hall. Very nice. But how was my deduction, my deducing? Not bad. I mean, from a, a zoomed in vector file, I think I did okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I don't really have a lot of uh, comments on that. You did say that you have some other things here. This does look polished. Some of the sentences are a little long, but that's, again, just me. The 
I do know that you do, in your things here, you, you do use a lot of, well, you were, zeroing, you were zeroing in, then veered south. Yeah, that's true. I was veering south. Um, I, I was thinking more um, because of those windows, but yeah, that's all good. Because I, I was, the, the, the same reason why I didn't think it was European is the same reason why I didn't think it was in the north because of all of the, um, the smaller side buildings. But Independence Hall, yeah. Um, the, okay, there are two schools of mine when, when, talk, when writing in accents. There are some who believe that you, like Mark Twain, and especially in Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, that you should write almost phonetically what a person sounds like. Other persons believe that it, is, it should be a light spice that you sprinkle through. It did make it a little bit harder, but then again, I was trying to do a, a slight accent, and... Um, but it does, you know, using the ye and the your, I, that I think, uh, does give a little bit of the flavor to it. But this second one down here, it, there, there are more apostrophes in here than you can shake a stick at. And it does give a, a feeling of authenticity of the, of the speaker, but it does make it sometimes too much of it could break that immersion that believability so in this situation in the article it works and is fine but if if you were to read 300 pages of someone like that talking well i wouldn't it would be very hard to enjoy that character because I'd be so trying so hard to figure out what is actually being said that I would lose the immersion into the story. But uh, that's, that's just me. The merchant captains are a bit more refined than commoners or more, most merchants. That does come across. That does come across here as the merchant who is doing that. So that does where you're not being able to build a large character and you just have a an appreciative merchant, almost practically anonymous, that does help bring that across. So thank you for that clarification. All right. Yeah, Twain was rough to read. Um, it was. And also... As much as I adore the character of Hagrid in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series, I didn't like reading Hagrid because of how much inflection and stuff like that was put into the stories. But it made him a lovable character with a distinct voice. But mm, I didn't like reading that. Okay. So we this is going to be... Um, the article we'll do next. However, we oh, let's get rid of that. We have a enough time before the. Did I? Yeah, we do have enough time before the next. The next um, critique when when Aaron comes back. So let's get into another. Writing sprint. Wait, I thought, did, did I not submit mine? Let's fix that. I keep telling my kids, homework's not done until it's turned in. And I, I, I feel like I didn't turn in my homework right there. <laughs> Okay, right about the technology that is lost. There we go. And refresh. And a 
disease for a cure which has recently been developed. Now, I actually had more ideas for this one than I had a previous one. And I know that Zogmadog was working on this article right before jumping over into this stream. And so this can be rather unique. So, uh, not sure how to eg exactly uh, name this thing because... Let me, let me explain a little bit about it, and maybe you could come up with a, uh, a name for it. What I'm deciding to do is this malady is that during the decimation where all fairies lost their magic, all of those fairies who were, had magic go through a withdrawal, meaning their bodies are so used to the magic that are, is imbued within them that they suffer withdrawal symptoms. They become malnourished. And those who would have been born fairies, even after the decimation, still have this now a hereditary disease. So being a fairy before the decimation was considered a blessing, afterwards it was considered a kind of a curse because the people were sickly and they were um, malnourished is the best. Um, so what could we call this? I'm open to suggestions. Given that description, what kind of a malady could we, we, could we use to describe this? Wasting. Ooh. The wasting. That kind of sounds cool. Scurvy, rickets, Burberry. No. Stunting. Malediction. Okay. A magical word or phrase uttered with the intention of bringing about evil or destruction, a curse. Yeah. That does, that does sound... That is a curse. But... The malediction, I guess, sounds clinical, whereas the wasting, I think, uh, I think the wasting, uh, yeah, I'm, it's done, yeah, I'm going to call it the wasting. Oh, I need my caps locks. The purge. <laughs> um... That has, that's too loaded of a phrase thanks to recent movies and TV shows. Oh, wasting as in I waste. No, my waste is not wasting. All right, um, yeah, the, the wasting. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. Just, yeah, let's just call it the wasting. Or. Um, fit the well. I can. The fairy. 
Uh, wait, Dinosaur Bob, R, Arcanidum. Addiction. Yeah, that's definitely not a word in the dictionary. Very loosely from Latin, loss of magic. I've got a wasting in my world. It's the blight that killed the forest and other plant life. Um, I think I'm going to combine, um, Javon's and this idea, the wasting, but it's also known as the fairy's malediction or the fairy's curse. That way it's not, so we know that it's specifically to the fairies and not, not, not commonly where everyone can do. Man, it just seems like. I keep going, changing color from red to green. This is weird. I gotta fix those lights up there. Okay, let's take a look. This is only affected species, the fairy and the fae, hosts and carries, origin. This is it's magical. It's. Hmm. Huh. I haven't decided how common fairies are, but I'm going to say it's kind of uncommon. And it is congenital. I think congenital means inherited, right? A disease or physical present present from birth. Okay, yeah, it's congenital. Okay. Uh, hosts and carriers, affected groups, cultural reception, epidemiology, prevention, sequela. What is that? A condition in which the consequence of a the condition which is a, the consequence of a previous disease or injury. Oh, okay. That's like lasting side effects, I guess. Prognosis, treatment, symptoms, cause. Transmission. There's no transmission because it's. Nope. Uh, make your choice. It's. Ooh, par well, not parasitic because uh, it wouldn't. It's not exactly a parasite. It's just the lack of magic. Mental. Genet yeah, it's a genetic. It's a gen because uh, in my world, fairies are a genetic inheritance. Okay. All right. Let us let us get ready here for another sprint, and let me reset. Get the get the music going again. There we go. And let's get the timer ready to go. And we um, get ready. Oh, Aegon, 27, finally done. Congratulations. Let's start 28.
All right. <laughs> All right, riding sprint. And is deficiency on that list? Mm, no. As far as type, no. Oh, down here, no, it's and also it's congenital. Okay, let's save those changes and let's get let's get talking. Hey. Okay, there we go. In the years following the Great Decimation, a new plague swept throughout the fairy community. Period. It was difficult to diagnose because, depending on the person, the symptoms was different. Period. The common elements of the sickness included weight loss, comma, skeletal frailties, comma, osteoporosis, uh, comma, degenerative of different organ systems, including eyesight. And in extreme situations, dementia, period. Yes, Dinosaur Bob, it, it's almost like rickets or Burberry. And when I was Googling for malnutritions, those did come up. I didn't want to use an actual name. Uh, and that's where it, in the category of the, the four categories of malnutrition, one of them was called the wasting. And so that's um, why I went with that word. But then again, the, uh, the malediction, recommended by Siobhan says it, it is kind of a curse but it's a curse perpetuated through genetics yeah I scurvy rickets and Barbary all at once yeah I think that would be a fair a fair thing to say um, but there a cure is made so we'll we will go with that. All right, back to uh, back to the sprint. This malnourishment that settled upon the fairies was given the name of, open quote, the wasting, close quote. It was difficult to find a cure, period. Many fairy tried to improve their diets their exercise and other non-magical means to improve their body systems and to improve their endurance, but that was insufficient, period. And due to the economic and global downturn, Due to the loss of magic, 
period, there were not many resources available to study this unknown condition. Period. It was commonly believed that moving to Trilinius or to Ma'uahi, comma, both holes in the release and consumption of the magical ley lines of Saga Dorm were believed to help alleviate the symptoms. Period. Colonies of fairy refugees quickly formed on these two island nations. Period. The cause of the wasting was the Great Decimation itself, period. The fairies for over 1700 years had magic in their system and this enhanced their body's natural abilities. Period. While fairies were still basically humans with magical powers, they were unable comma their genetics became reliant upon the magical energies that coursed through their bodies. Period. Much like a individual who is in a low gravity environment has their muscles atrophy comma or someone is bedridden for a long time comma the natural defenses and abilities of the fairies had atrophied as well. Hey AJ, welcome. Just in the middle of a sprint. Period. New line. It was many decades later that researchers at these fairy colonies had finally developed a potion that allowed the fairies to be revitalized to a certain extent, period. The potions, comma, unlike those before the Great Decimation, comma, were petrified remains of the different blessed animals, and they were not imbued with magic because there were no fairies or magic users to reconstitute the organic matter that had been previously petrified, period. However, depending on the fairies' genetics and which element or combination thereof, they would have used had they 
had magic, comma, an animal core of that matching element type would alleviate the sy symptoms, period. As the discovery of these minerals that could be consumed by the fairies, former spread throughout the world, comma, fairies were now able to have equivalent health and vitality as the humans, period. However, the wasting was never removed from the cured, period. In society, comma, the, the birth of a fairy child was considered one of the greatest blessings to the family before the Great Decimation, period. Afterwards, comma, it became a source of difficulty and anguish because they knew the difficult life that the child would have throughout its life, period. Charities and organizations were formed to help the fairy to survive and maybe even thrive through therapeutics and the use of blessed minerals, period. Prejudices against the fairies, comma, and specifically the the fairy's malediction comma caused that those who were fairies to not be viewed as suitable partners with whom to build a family period. Many fairies, former fairies, in a sense of duty to Saga Dorm and the prevention of spreading the malediction, voluntarily refused to have children, period. Many humans also not wanting to have their children suffer did not mate with those with the malediction, period. Within a couple of centuries, comma, 
the wasting had nearly disappeared from Saga Dorm as there were fewer and fewer former fairies who were able to pass their genetics along to continue the malediction, period. Well, that was depressing. <laughs> you know, don't you hate it when a story starts writing itself and you have no control over it? Man, that's just depressing. But, you know, there... Hmm. I don't know. Wow, oh, I'm green. I really got to figure out this camera color. Yeah. The cursed condition is going to be my last because it's going to be the hardest to write. Yeah. Um, I liked this idea at the beginning of it. But, you know, the, the, this thinking about the impact of this, thinking about how, I mean, depressing it could be. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure how much I like this article. But, checking the metadata. 581 words, it's done. I've got an interesting twist in mind for my cursed condition. Cool. After that, I'll have six more to work on. Hey, AJ, good job. Yeah, this was not a favorite. But it is a prompt. And it did give me some ideas for different stories. Hey, you got your copper. Good job. I don't have a lot of history laid out except a backbone of it. And the only diseases I have in my world currently are either not known to those who carry it or no cure for it yet. Wow, that, that's going to be a ch that's a that's a rough one. Um, wow, that that is a challenge. But I think that's why we need to do these writing prompts because I definitely would not have thought of these things and building out my world if it weren't for these, because even though I take the basis of a fairy tale, work it over, and then try to fit it in the story, having these kind of prompts, knowing the nitty gritty of the world is allowing me to better and more effectively, I think, uh, make it real. Because I could tell a story about the person who invented this. I could tell the story of a, a, a child whose life was turned around because they had this mineral or the struggle of a mother or father trying to find a, uh, or afford the this cure for their child even though they had not um, imagined that you know, they, they didn't have any fairies in the, their genealogy that they knew of because, you know, genealogical records in, in a medieval situation, not that great. But they that would be a definite struggle they could have. Hey, gone. Yeah, they would have been useful. They have given me direction. Events like World Ember just left me dizzy trying to figure out what to write about. I'm going to use the Summer Camp 2019 prompts to do World Ember. Awesome. Now, is World Ember, it's what, 10,000 words? 
I haven't done a World Ember yet. Uh, I'm, I joined, I think, in November um, after NaNoWriMo last year. So I really wasn't into the community to participate. Yeah, 10K in one month. And is that any, any article? Or, or any format? Because could a manuscript be cons count for World Anvil? Anything. Cool. Well, it's, it sounds like I'm going to do 50K in November and 10K in December. That's going to be good. Okay. Maybe even start a new world for that. That might be fun to try to recreate something from scratch because I've been so involved with Saga Dorm for so long. Okay, we'll save these changes. Let's go in and to the community challenges. There's the disease submitted. Let's go to progress. I think next one I'll be doing is World Ember. Give me more material for the world before I start up the campaign. Yeah, very good. But you don't have to wait for World Ember. Oh, yeah. Hydrate. No. Uh, and as a part of my current health plan, I try to drink like four of these a day and they're like uh, 32 ounces each. So yeah, lots and lots of water. Okay, and thank you for the redemption. Okay, um, oh. Okay, Dinosaur Bob, I'm going to flesh out the entire world of my seafarer dwarves in World Enver. I drink too much water. It gives me heartburn for some reason. There's another condition that drinking too much water gives me, but it's usually wearing a path to a certain porcelain facility. <laughs> That's what too much water does for me. All right. Um, so I've accomplished my goals for tonight. Is Aaron back <laughs> that yeah that too <laughs> um because we he did uh the introduction to goblins he wanted me to critique that but said he was going to be out so uh what we may need to do is is there anyone else who has a prompt or not a, prom a prompt that they would like to discuss an article that they would like to have showcased as we uh, work out the time um, before our next uh, writer writing stream starts. I believe that uh, WD Michael is scheduled uh, for the late night shift. Um, but see, there, there are others. It's Friday night. No, there aren't others because it's Friday night. <laughs> uh, wow, that is a long stream he does. Okay. Well, I... Did you see my Strawberry Festivals article yet? I don't know if I did. Because you, you mentioned it while I was working on my Lemon Festival, but I don't think I've read your Strawberry Festival. Why don't you send that over? We can, I can, I can read that. Because I do love strawberries. Okay, thinking about the other ones, let's see, the, the other prompts that are coming up. 
Okay, there you go, Dennis for Bob. All right. A history of a settlement that was almost entirely wiped out and then was rebuilt. I think I'm going to be doing Trilinius on that. Again, the Great Decimation. I'm, I'm building a lot of stuff around that. Lag. Uh, a species in your world that is bred or farmed for a high value resource. I don't know what to do that one because I have stated that my blessed animals cannot be domesticated animals. So I have to come up with a different creature than because that are bred or farmed. That is the key question there. And an unassuming character who, is sec who secretly controls things from behind the scenes. Ooh, I'm gonna have to do some brainstorming before the next stream happens. The Kafi tree. All right, let's turn off the music. Where's that? Mine for that is crazy. Oh, the person behind the scenes? Well, Aegon, AJ, if you have articles, wait, wrong article. The, okay, the Kafi tree is not the strawberry festivals. They're pretty. A fallen diva who is manipulating the world to get artifacts to get revenge on the god who threw her away. Ooh. Dang, that's a backstory. The Spud Barrow Strawberry Festival. Oh, those look so heavenly. <laughs> Why a name like... Yeah, Strawberry Goodness is right. I grew up in a city where our fruit... We had a lot of fruit trees up in the mountains. And so every fall we had a fruit festival of tree fruit varieties. And I'm being intentionally vague, so you don't know the city where I grew up. <laughs> um, but yeah... Uh, nothing like Gilroy, California and the Garlic Festival, I'll guarantee you that. Well, a name like Spud Barrow, you'd be thinking you knew all the village to be famous for, but you'd be wrong. Sure, they grow taters by the bushel, but the real treat to come out of that burg is strawberries. The biggest you ever see and the sweetest you ever taste. I tell you, and the pies. Oh, the pies. Algebra Oakbottom describing Spud Barrow produce to a new traveler in the region. Yeah. I have strawberry slash blueberry farm less than 15 minutes when I used to get them fresh from the... Oh, man. Oh, I'm jealous. I don't think there are many strawberry farms here in the Rocky Mountains. At least not near where I live. Too hot. The village of Spudborough, a predominantly halfling settlement on the Faywood Forest Road that links Faybridge Crossing with Carnstown, was named for the tubers grown there not only for local use, but to supply the shops of Carnstown. But potatoes are not the only crop grown there. In fact, are not even the most famous among the regional folk. That honor goes to that honor belongs to the strawberry. Spud Barrow strawberries are much sought after, fresh during their season, and in numerous varieties of preserves the rest of the year. The residents of Spud Barrow, being mostly halflings, are always on the lookout for an opportunity to throw a party. So during the third week of the time of Amalthea's Oak. Mid, approximately midway. Okay, 
Midway between New Year's Day and the first turning holiday, the entire village takes part in a week-long celebration as the first strawberry crop ripens. Folk from up and down the road, farmers and town folk, and even the elves and occasional fae come to the village to take part of the celebration of one of the first products of the new growing season. It, it, is the stream still going? Hello? Anyone? Okay, thank you. Uh, my, my test computer that I have over here uh, just suddenly had a network error. Monk Zoya, oh, welcome! Thank you for coming. Yeah, it, it gave me a network 2000 error, and so that made me panic a little bit. Twitch twitching, yeah. No, we have time to do it, Aaron. Uh, uh, I am reading the Strawberry Festival, and then we can do it next, because we still have a half an hour on this stream, if not more, depending on uh, when W.D. Michael starts his stream. So good. I'm glad that you made it back. Okay. Uh, the entire village takes part in a week-long celebration as the first strawberry crop ripens. Folk from up and down the road, farmers and town folk, and even the elves, an occasional fae come to the village to take part in the celebration of one of the first fresh products of the new growing season. <laughs> I ain't touching that one with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> the festival day. The strawberry festival is, first and foremost, an excuse for a week-long party. I'm glad you got your priorities straight. Communal dining tables are set up in the village center. All of the villagers bring prepared foods for the feast and ale, provided by the Gnomish Miller Brewer, a week's journey up the road, flows freely. Um, this, this clause that you have out here um, kind of, I'm not a fan of these kind of, uh, of these things, because this is a whole thought in and of itself. Where did the ale come from? So it's like splitting an infinitive. It's like splitting up a logical sentence. So that's my personal thing where um, you, here you are, where you could just say the prepared food, bringing prepared foods for the feast and the ale flows freely. Gener then period, generously provided by the Gnomish Miller Brewer a week's journey up the road. Um, that way you have a complete thought, complete thought, and you're not um, having to jump back going, okay, flows freely. What flow f flew freely? Ah, the ale flows freely. You know, that that kind of thing for, you know, ease of uh, thing, uh, of reading along. But that's my personal style. Each festival day begins in the late morning with spread of, spreads of strawberry pastries and flat cakes piled high for brunch. The second halfling meal of the day. Ah, second breakfast. Uh, the tables are then cleared for lunch, then for tea, then for supper before the sun sets. With the festival still going strong into the night, dinner is spread under torch and lantern light. The communal party breaks up in time for the halflings to grab their nightcap at home before retiring to prepare for another day of frivolity. Each day of the festival, awards are given for the best strawberry products made by villagers and others who wish to enter their best recipes. On the first day of the festival, strawberry pies are the highlight. The best pies are judged, and there is a pie-eating contest in the early afternoon, between tea and supper. The second day 
is for judging of strawberry jams and jellies. The third day celebrates strawberry sweets with plentiful samples for the children of the village. The fourth day is for strawberry juice-based liquid refreshments, and the fifth is for strawberry wines. The sixth day, the last day of the festival, is for strawberry cakes. Okay, strawberry sweets. Is that like candy? Is that like a hard candy, like those really cheap things that you get uh, on Halloween that are wrapped up to look like strawberries, which I absolutely love and steal from my children? Something like that? Because when you say sweets, you know, when, when I look at this picture that you have under here that's absolutely heavenly, that might be more of a cake. But I, I guess I just don't know what you mean by a sweet. Is that a tart? Is that a baked good? Or is that candies and leathers? Okay. Cool. There are various other games and activities for the children, including hoop rolling, wheelbarrow races, and egg tosses. The adult folk are generally content with enjoying the food and drink, and each other's company. Fruit roll-ups. Oh yeah, I'm... I'm familiar with fruit leather. I guess that's an older term. Uh, we, we made fruit leather all the time with the fruits of the aforementioned trees, which shall not be named. <laughs> um, there are some games of skills and of chance. Small tables pop up as needed for games of cards or tiles. Ah, dominoes. Okay. But when all is said and done, it is the food, particularly the strawberries, that everyone is there to enjoy. Another highlight of each evening of the festival is the performance, performance provided by the traveling troupe. The troupe makes sure the carriage of marvelous wonders arrives in Spudbarrow in time for the festival each year. They stay and perform for the six days of celebration. Is this your the prompt for the vehicle that brings happiness wherever it goes? If so, or if not, I like the integration of bringing those two things together. That's really fun. Observance. The Strawberry Festival takes place during the week midday, midway between New Year's Day, the spring equinox, and the first turning, or summer's day, the summer solstice. I, oh, I like that, the turning, the first turning. I like how, using that instead of solstice. That's a, that's a new term I haven't heard before. The third week of the time of Amalthea's Oak it is held rain or shine. If the weather is inclement, pavilion tents are erected to protect the spreads of food. Did you see the cake that old Clotilde put out for judging this year? Her finest work, that was. Berries in the batter, berries in the frost, and berries decorating all around. And the taste, mm, too bad we have to wait another year for more. Uh, credits. Da, 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 da. Visitors from outside the town. The festival draws attendees from up and down the Carnston Road and from the deeper Feywood itself. The elves and the occasional Fey appear out of the wood during the day and disappear back into the forest by night. As for other human folk, mostly human, but with a smattering of gnome, dwarf, and other folk accommodate space is provided so the festival goers have a place to sleep off each day's indulgences. I, um, I would, again, this, this is where a, your interjection offset by the dashes makes it hard to read because uh, you talk about the other folk, and then you jump into what you categorize all the other folk, and then 
you're talking about accommodation space. Um, I, again, your mileage may vary, but I would probably uh, split those out. Many set up tents. Some make use of covered wagons. Special areas are marked off by the townsfolk of Spudborough to accommodate tents, wagons, and draft animals. All are welcome as long as they behave themselves. Great. I, I do like that. That sounds like a party. And I don't know why, but I get the imagery of an alpine village. That all of these cute alpine-esque houses line the city and it's just it's a big festival with um all these strawberries those, oh those look yummy so yeah fun article fun fun celebration there okay cool all right aaron you still here as I hydrate. While uh, we're, we're just waiting for the lag, I did want to show Bink Bilbo's birthday six days long. That sounds like fun. Okay, I did want to show I am working on my first emote here that I'll be adding as soon as it's done, hopefully this weekend. Just in the washroom, he's, he'll be right out. Okay. Uh, this is going to be my first emote, the, the Lemon Raid. Uh, this is done in Inkscape. It is a vector-based program similar to Adobe Illustrator. And is the um, an open? Yeah, it's open source, free, cross-platform Mac, PC, Linux, and it's just been something that I have been working on. And it'll look really interest. It'll look a lot better when it's super tiny. <laughs> but this has been uh, a fun little side project that I didn't. That thanks to everyone's generosity, I am able to do so much earlier than I thought. Okay. Yeah, Inkscape's great. I'm yeah, I'm thinking, I'm trying to I want to learn how to draw and and I'm thinking of that I may just have similar to other streamers who have those chill streams where they just draw and chat. I might try to improve my drawing abilities on on stream because nothing says enjoyment of a new hobby than failing over and over in front of a live internet audience. But I'm not sarcastic. I'm going to be in my office anyway. I might as well just turn on the camera. Okay, he's back. Awesome. I have this zoomed in quite a bit. Okay, this is the introduction inter <laughs> introduction to goblins would you know a goblin if you were standing in the room with one hmm. okay so, all right this ooh we might have a narrative here annie filled filed into the lecture room with the other students amidst the murmurs and scrapes of chairs and settled herself into the back where she hoped she would remain unnoticed. The figure at the blackboard was both striking and imposing. Let me just zoom into this. His long silver hair hung down his back in a practical braid and highlighted his pointed alfar ears. There was a large classroom, a huge desk, and a speaking podium between her and the professor, and she wondered if she would be able to hear him at all. Very good, began the professor, not turning to face them. His voice seemed to fill all corners of the room. Students, please take your seats. 
seat in an orderly fashion. I see we have a new student among us. Please introduce yourself, dear. Annie wondered for a moment if he was talking about her, then realized that he had to be. Me, sir? she asked stupidly. He responded, still facing the blackboard. I see no other new students, making the little gnome wonder how he had seen her at all. As he turned, as he turned, she was stunned by his blood-violet eyes meeting her. Her bold, sorry, his bold violet eyes meeting her. You know, she had absolutely no idea what color her eyes were. After all, she hadn't specified when she polymorphed into this gnome form, and under his gaze she suddenly, awkwardly, wondered if he could see through her disguise. So sorry she stammered as she gazed into his ancient eyes from across the room, seeing the thousands of years of wisdom, compassion, and learning, she thought to herself, Oh crap, I'm falling for the elf. I'm Annie, she continued, Annie Spindizzy of the Crankshaft Spindizzies. Annie Spindizzy hailing from Crankshaft, echoed the old professor. I haven't seen old Chromium spin dizzy since, well, per- probably before you were born, girl. I would take it that you're his granddaughter then? Yes, sir, she nodded, a smile crossing her face, and she suddenly felt herself glad to have done the research. Steel spin dizzy and Gemma Freebolt are my parents, but I didn't know you knew my grandfather. A somewhat half-hearted, half-smile crossed the old Alfar's face, and she noted how elves' faces rarely betray their age. You will find, young lady, there are very few of importance who are slinging spells that I have not crossed words with at one point or another, and my memory is edactic. I must say, you look not a thing like your mother— though I can see some of your father in your hair. We will speak more on this later. Annie Spindizzy from Crankshaft, when the class is not waiting for us. Please take your seat. Fomorians, wrote the elf upon the blackboard, as he echoed the word with his voice, or in draconic, and he scrawled the same in draconic speech and alphabet, and in elven, and he wrote and spoke again in Alfar and Sidhi. This last bit fascinated Annie, as she knew enough about the elves to know that most Alfar never bothered to learn the dialect of Sidhi, or vice versa. It actually was a bone of contention between the two types of elves. Both con- It's pronounced she. Okay. All right, thank you for the correction. Both considered their own tongue superior to the other. She felt her mind wander off, wondering if the Svartalfar or the Dunshi had separate languages, if they ever bothered to learn them, or whether or not they bothered at all to differentiate. From the back of her mind, she heard the professor's voice. They don't, actually. She realized she had been daydreaming, pondering for a brief instant, for a brief instant, maybe, for a brief instant on how long she had been doing that, and snapped her eyes up at once again, up to once again, eyes up to... Okay, uh, to once again meet, is, you've split your infinitive. And so I would, to meet, comma, once again, comma, is how I would cor- correct that. We don't, uh, you don't want to split your infinitive there. To meet the direct gaze of the professor, she found herself wondering how long he'd been staring at her and if she'd actually heard his voice. Then she realized in that awful instant that much of the class was looking at her, 
and that she had no idea what she had just been asked. Long trip from crankshaft, Miss Spindizzy, chided the teacher. Trick question, of course. Everyone knew that even though the physical distance between crankshaft and Cimarron was vast, but it was only one simple wormhole jump to get there, as there was not much in between. I- I'm sorry, she stammered. Of course not, sir. I must have slept poorly. The old elf regarded her for a moment before saying calmly, I'm not one of those professors that allows a student to take a little nap in their class and expect to catch up later. I will not hold your hand, Annie Spindizzy. If you can't keep up, we will not slow down for you. Not a good way to make a first impression. You will please remain after class so that we can discuss the matter. Yes, sir, she nodded. On with the lesson, continued Selnaris. For those of you who do not know me, you will find that I am not prone to repeat myself either. Would somebody please repeat the question for Miss Spindizzy? A small, dumpy human who smelled sharply of salt and who definitely, who was definitely trying to score points with the prof. Um, is that going to be a common vernacular for someone to call him prof? as opposed to professor. It, it just seems like the narration is a little bit more formal than uh, calling someone a prof. Stood and said before anyone could answer, What do the gnomes call the goblins? Formorians, the head corrected. Miss Spindizzy? Ah, so goblins and for is... Like a pejorative for Formorians? Interesting. Okay. She opened her mouth to answer when she heard a loud, somewhat high-pitched, squeaking voice say from behind the desk, Oh, for the sake of the heavens, you moron. Do you really think they give a dire rats what the gnomes call a goblin? What in all the sons make you think you're even qualified to teach this class, mage? Sorry for the editing there. With that, small, with that, a small gnomish figure climbed up onto the chair and then onto the desk's surface. He was stocky and weathered, with bright blue hair and brighter blue eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, returned the mage, I give you, perhaps... The only mind in the universe verse from which I would tolerate being called a moron. Perhaps the greatest mind in the universe, Professor Selgorn. The whole class erupted in uproarious applause, and Annie felt herself swept up in the excitement. Selgorn stood on the top of the desk, giving a little imperial wave and gesturing for everyone to take their seats. Thank you, thank you. Your applause is appreciated, but time is money, friend. Turning back to Solnaris, he continued, Seriously, mage, you really think that this group of students wants to sit here for a semester while you babble on about the gnomish perspective on goblins? If there ain't a gnome among there ain't a gnome among them. Annie stood up to protest. But Professor Selgorn shot her a look and a wink that said to her, You don't really want to get into this right now, do you? Instead, she found herself wondering if she, if he'd just flirted with her. I like the tension. I like the undertone there. That is that is fun. Come, care to take over then, my friend? Inquired the elven professor. And when Selgorn ind- indicated that maybe he would... Solnaris made an open-handed gesture, indicating that he had the floor. The diminutive gnome began to pace across the large desk. All at once now, what is the motto of Cimmerian University? As a chorus, the class chanted, All stand equally before the book. In short, he continued, who can tell me what that means? Like somebody had attached a rocket to his underpants, that same dumpy human, I would remove that comma, that same 
dumpy because the same dumpy and human are not it's not a list that's underpants that I'd probably get rid of those two commas because you ha you have a clause here and then you have a secondary under clause I I just probably just have that one okay that same dumpy human shot up out of his chair and blurted out, It means everyone is judged of their own merits. Everybody has the right to learn magic. The gnomish teacher made a little jump like somebody had prodded him in the backside and barked out, Holy stars, your head nearly went all the way up <laughs> me there. What did you say your name was? Looking chagrined, the portly man responded, Lucas, sir. Lucas Porter. Nobody likes a brown nose, Lucas. Take your seat and wait to be called next time. But you are correct. All are welcomed in Cimmerian University. Everybody gets to learn. Well, we're here to learn about goblins and goblinoids. And since all are welcome here, why don't we just ask them? Goblins, tell us a little about yourselves. He looked around, meeting the eyes of random students, to the awkward silence as, obviously, there were no goblins here. No goblins that was except Annie, who suddenly felt very, very alone. When the professor's gaze stopped on her, she almost blurted out the truth, but there was a look in his eyes, an almost imperceptible shake of his head, that told her now was not the time. Okay, I like this professor already. I hope he doesn't do something stupid by the end, because I already like him. She was convinced of it now. She wasn't fooling anybody. Well, not anybody who mattered. The professors knew that she was a hat goblin, or at least some form of goblin, and she was going to have to face that. After the pause, he continued, Hmm, interesting, he seemed to ponder. No goblin students. Not one. Not a hobgoblin. Not a ven goblin. Who here thinks they have any idea why that is? A banshee, meaning a female elf of she descent. In this case, a member of the banshee cheerleading team. <laughs> that is so perfect. On so many levels. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not like I had to... Uh, no, I won't go there. <laughs> um, again, like Dinosaur Bob, I'm not a fan of the um, thing here, but... That is, you can't get rid of that. Um, you, you just can't. That's just... Because, okay, are your banshees, other than being an elf of she descent, are they the traditional, def do they match the traditional definition of a banshee? Because if a banshee cheerleader is just so funny. So, like, okay, she, stu she stuck her hand in the air and, and, when acknowledged, asked cheerfully, Goblins can't read, can they? Selgorn looked at her and returned, Which are you asking? Are they blind or are they stupid? Looking pretty stupid herself, she said, Uh, neither, I guess. With a nod, he carried on, Would anyone else like to take a stab at it? With, perhaps... A more thought-out question? The fat little Lucas hesitantly put his hand up and asked, Goblins can't use magic. The gnome just stared at him, blinking, for a good long moment before not bothering to acknowledge him, and asked, Anyone? How about Miss Spindizzy? suggested the aged elf. She's a gnome like you, Selgorn, and we all know the gnomes and the goblins have a long history of hatred between them. Maybe she knows something about goblins. 
Now she was in for it, of course. She knew about goblins. What she didn't know was what gnomes know about goblins, and what she didn't know could get her caught. Uh, goblins don't write, she blurted out after a moment he- moment's hesitation. Selgorn reached for the heavens with an ecstatic look upon his face, then shot a look over to Salneris, exclaiming, Serenistas ever balance scales, Selnar. Some of them can use their heads for something other than a repository for food. Annie was so taken aback by such a familiar moniker being used to describe the great archmage Salnarius, Ki Mer- Marne, that she nearly missed the rest of what he what of what was said. It was like hearing Prince. Arthur Goldenweir, the third of hope, described as Big Artie. Not correct, but at least it shows that you know something about goblins. What did he mean, not correct? How dare that pudgy little, big-nosed, gnomish person say that was not correct? Annie felt her racial pride swell up in the face of this gnome, and she wanted to go slap him. And what I mean by not correct is not entirely correct. Though, as a rule, goblins who write are exceptions, it is not that reason that keeps them out of Cimmerian University. And to further clarify, we are referring to the primitive land-based goblins here. Goblins in space write. There is no other way to navigate. Okay, maybe she wouldn't slap him. Just pinch that big, ugly nose of his. She knew gnome women were supposed to find that attractive, but she just couldn't look at his rumpled up, squinty-eyed, probuscally endowed face and think anything but troll. Smart troll, but troll. Okay, exasperated the troll, tossing his hands in the air for effect. It is clear to me that if we're going to discuss goblins, and indeed Fomorians in general, that we're going to have to start at the very beginning. Annie may have a leg up on given on you given what she said. Oh, no. Annie may have a leg up on you given who she is, but we'll catch you up. Take out your textbooks. You all did remember to buy your textbooks, didn't you? For this class, you will require the Pathfinder role-playing game core rulebook by P- Paizo Publishing. At the very least, Psychonics Unleashed, though preferably Ultimate Psychonics, both by Dream Scared Press. These two books are essential to your understanding of goblins. To understand goblins and space and the relationship therein, you will also require the Starfinder Core Rule Book by Pazzo, P- Paizo Publishing. Other books referred to, but not essential for this class, are Advanced Player's Guide, Advanced Class Guide, and Mythic Adventures. Oh, sorry. Okay, well done. You got the name perfectly. Okay, don't read. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm having fun. I hope you guys are having fun. I'm having fun. So we're going to continue. Sir, rose the hand of the end voice of the young banshee. If we're just going to refer to the textbooks, what do we need you for? There was a bright smile on her face that said she thought herself funny. And clearly, the professor did too, because he started laughing. Girl, I didn't, I don't think you would know a goblin if you were standing in the room with one, he snapped. Well, they smell bad, don't they? she asked meekly. What? All of a sudden, goblins are troglodytes? You can smell them coming? I can think of a couple of hobgoblin janitors who would be very insulted by that. Annie was almost giggling now, but couldn't help herself. Male goblins do smell pretty bad, sir. Some, many, perhaps most. Almost all, she interrupted, now giggling herself. Miss Spindizzy, chuffed the prof, kindly get a hold of yourself, and while I won't ask you... How you know goblins smell bad, or better yet, how you know female ones don't, I will ask you to contain interruptions to a minimum. 
With that, the professor buckled over at the waist, hands clutched at the back of his head. As he tugged at something at the back of his skull, he said, muffled into his chest, Almost all. But I stand here as a testament that not only do goblins not all smell bad, but that they do right. You wouldn't know one if you were talking to him. As he stood up, he pulled the mundane mask from off from his face to reveal the wizened, handsome face of an older, though still good-looking, Bartor Goblin. The whole class gasped in awe, Annie included. Now pick up your pens and prepare to take notes, because we're going to start at the very beginning. How fun. The empire would not function without goblins, and yet their social status is, is on the bottom of the pyramid. How that is, that was delightful. Um, okay, from, from a narrative point of view, this was an excellent short story. You had a, you had a protagonist in Annie, you had the antagonist in the, 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 um, the other professor. You had, uh, the twist reveal at the end. You had the character arc where, uh, she was timid, and she came to laugh about herself. I love the big reveal at the end. Um, yeah. Um, and the and the sign of a good story is that I want to I want it to go I want it to keep going. I would love to see the interaction between Annie and the professor continue. It's it was it was just fun to oh let's uh, that was just fun to read because of the the, the, the characters well well written characters. Um, I was surprised. I did not see that coming. I honestly did not see that coming. Um, so is this Annie or is this a, a generic person? And yeah, and the, the stereotypes that you were able to present and then squash at the same time, time also well done. I did give you, I mean, that's, oh, this is Annie. Is this Annie in her goblinoid form or her or flip the other form, the other name for it? Fomorians. Okay. Is this her Fomorian form as opposed? Yes, goblin. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, that was just a fun read. Well worth the length. Um... Uh, I hope I did the voices okay. I kind of got into it as I was reading along. Um, I did go nasally with the uh, the small professor. Um, I wish I did a more authoritative voice with the professor. Um, I'm not. I don't do a Valley Girl very well. Okay. Yeah. Um, Voices, reading, reading fun voices it is a good one. Oh, thank you so much for redeeming those points there, Aaron. Do appreciate that. And this is, this is the kind of stuff that I hope to be able to continue doing, especially uh, for fiction, things like that. My, my strength, not strength, I don't know, but I, I really enjoy reading fiction life. Okay, well, um, I know this story. I did a first pass edit on this, and I loved seeing it through your eyes. Oh, thank you. 
Um, yeah. I like Annie. I like the professor. And I'm glad that he's he was the good guy at the end. I'll still I'll just I'll just put it at that. Uh I, I'm just really happy with that. Um But as 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 much as this I do try to, you know, the family friendly, I did um I really did like the, the hint at romance. Even though professor student romance is really shouldn't be there and is improper, I did like that there was that slight attraction to the professor because um, what did she say at the beginning? Oh, darn, am I falling in love with him? Um, Yeah, there, there is some where she just, um, yeah, I'm falling for this elf. Well, I, I, I like that, um, because of, yeah, I just, I just like it. Okay, great article. Thank you so much for sharing that. Let's, uh, take a look if there is anybody, um, we're, we've, Gone past the top of the hour. Well worth it, definitely. Um, don't worry about those extra points. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I just want to award and reward those who are m most loyal to the channel. And I swear I'm following anyone, but I'm not seeing anybody um, live. Is there anyone from the Anvilite Streamer Core who's broadcasting right now? them. Oh, good. He is, he is live. All right. We will do that. Oh, this is inception. Too many streams going on. Okay. So, um, So, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you so much for watching the sprints, submitting your articles, and uh, sharing your creative juices and inspirations with me. I really enjoyed it. I love reading fiction. I love writing. And this is an awesome community that I'm so happy to be a part of. Please, I think for the next, like, 36 hours, there is somebody streaming on the Anvilite World, uh, Anvilite Streamer Core, please go visit that website and you, and pick someone to watch. You you can watch practically all weekend long. I will be here tomorrow night at six p.m. Pacific, nine p.m. Eastern, where I will do at least two and maybe even the final three of the prompts, and then and. Uh, then I, I'll take Sunday off. But again, go out there, sh shout out, it's a lemon raid, or just lemon raid when you see WD Michael. And let's try, hopefully, oh, come on, this is, all right, my, there we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, gonna start this raid off, so please remember, in the chat, yell Lemon Raid, and I will see you again tomorrow night for more World Anvil Summer Camp 2020. Good night, everybody.